And so just as it is in life, the spiritual journey takes you to places and, and, and walks you in ways that you hadn't planned on, that you didn't see coming. But if you know it's a spiritual journey and that God is leading you, you're going to be all right. And Abraham is walking. He's blessed wherever he goes. And to walk with this God, you find out that Abraham now, this word comes to him, a man who doesn't even have a child, that he's going to be the father of nations. You can't get your brain around that. This is a spiritual journey. And Abraham walks it out and has a couple kids. And then, you know, by the time we get to Joseph, they, he goes into Egypt. And none, none of this is really making a whole lot of natural sense. And by the time their whole family goes, to, goes into Egypt, it's 70 of them in there as a family that come, that come out of Egypt and then by the time we get to Moses, it's like a whole nation. What started with a man with no kids ended up a family of 70 going to see Joseph. A pharaoh rose and took them over, but they come out three million people. This is a spiritual journey. And God's, God has to deal with them. And, and the beautiful thing about having your Bible, whether it's on your phone or whether it's a paper Bible or whatever it is, is that you have the benefit of compressing time and events so that you remove time out of the equation because when God is taking them on a spiritual journey, it walks them through generations and, and decades and it walks them through some 600 years. Uh, uh, but but when, they, when they're in the wilderness, they're in there for 40 years and you can read the thing in 40 minutes. So we are able to compress time because we can read what Solomon wrote and what David wrote and what Samuel wrote, and we can read it in minutes, but God was moving through time, which is part of God's genius is his ability to manipulate human history to prove his point. And he's teaching them something about this journey. Let me just walk, just walk with me for just a minute. He's teaching them something about this journey, and so that they are able to track with him, God be begins to mark things. He marks things and sets patterns in their lives. And so that he can build within their culture the understanding that he is their God. And he marks them in such a way that they can't forget it because he gives them too much to do because you can't forget it. So he steps into time and space. He says, let me get into your time. And so every day, every day, God marked them. You have to pray three times a day. Morning, noon, and when the sun goes down. That was their custom. God said, I'm going to mark your time. I'm going to mark your time so you can't go very long without remembering me. And they said, I want to get into your calendar because not am I going to get into your day every day three times a day i need you to pray he said but then once a week let me jump into your calendar because one day they called it the sabbath one day out of the seven is no work no labor this is the sabbath where you gather together and you also worship me the sabbath is not a day off the sabbath is a day to remember so now god's in their calendar God said, not am I going to deal with you every, every day and every week. He said, I like to deal with you every year. Now I'm going to give you some things to do every year. Once a year, you have the day of atonement or at one mint. You're going to have the day of atonement. Three times a year, you're going to have a feast. And you're going to get up from where you're at, and you're all going to come together, and you're going to observe the feast. And so you see that God was making a point. He is a God of patterns. you got to watch him. He's a God of patterns. Three times a day, once a week, three times a year, God says, I'm getting in your calendar. So you remember me. And then God said, let me, let me go beyond your calendar and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get involved uh, in your food. God knows human beings better than anybody. He's the one who created us. You start messing with our time and our food and you got us. <laughs> so he said, I'm going to get in your food and I'm going to give you classifications. This is holy food. This is unholy food. You can eat this. You can't eat that. You can eat this if you kill it a certain way. But you can't eat that if you don't do it right. 
And if it has a split hoof, no. If it has a red hoof, yes. No pork. How many glad Jesus came to save you? And, and no. <laughs> These, these become the Levitical laws, but, they, but he was in their food. And if you eat the lamb, you got to eat it all. You got to eat the whole thing. You got to sit down. You gotta, there's a way to eat it. You got to sit down at the table. And everything has to be in a certain way. God said, I'm going to get up in your food. And do you know that still to this day, observant Jews cannot eat a cheeseburger because you can't have meat and dairy together. I just want somebody to raise up your hands and thank Jesus for the blood. Thank him. Thank him. And so, so he got involved in their food. Now he's in the calendar. He's in the food. They said, let me, get, let me get involved in your clothes. He said, this is holy garments, clean garments, they would be referred to, and unclean garments. This is what's proper to wear. This is what's not proper to wear. And you can wear this garment, but you can't wear garments that have two kinds of fabric put together. No polys. No polyester. No polys. No blends. And uh, so this was the way that he did it. He said, these are clothes. These are men's clothes. These are women's clothes. These are priestly garments. These are holy garments. These are unholy garments. All of that kind of thing. So now he's involved in time, calendar, food, and clothes. He said, now I want to get involved in your economics. He said, now... The first of everything you have is mine. That's going to help you remember me. And so the first of your goats, not that sick one over there that's fixing to die anyway, but the first one, the good one, that's mine. And they had all these offerings. You guys remember reading some of these? The heave offerings, the peace offerings, the burnt offerings. The, he has all these offerings. Now, please, please, if God is involved in your time, your calendar, your clothes, and your food, and your money, you got to remember him. You would think that that would be far enough. But then God says, let me get involved in your sexuality. You as a person. I'm, I'm going to say, this is a male. I know this is a revelation. This is a female. And God says, the males, watch this, the males, eight days old, will be circumcised. This was part of God's thing. This is how we're going to do this. Because it's hard to forget certain things. And when people would be followers of the way, followers of God, people of the promise, after they were grown, then the sign of the covenant in their flesh was circumcision. That is a serious altar call. So God says, now, I have marked your time, your calendar, your clothes, your diet, your person, because I want you to remember me. Just walk with me for just a minute now because this is a spiritual journey. And so now God's bringing them out of Egypt and you know the 10 plagues that they come through. They didn't have something like this to baptize 3 million people. That would take all, all the time. So God walked them through the Red Sea, which is a sign of baptizing the whole. He God said, I'm just going to baptize all y'all at once. You're going to be dry, but you're coming through the water. They come out on the other side and now God leads them. Getting to where I'm going. God leads them with a cloud and fire cloud by day fire by night and this is this is a spiritual journey Moses where are we going we're following that cloud this is a spiritual journey and the cloud then gives you shade when it's hot and the fire gives you warmth when it's cold and God provides for them manna that comes from the heavens God causes water to come from a rock. It doesn't make sense, but this is a spiritual journey, and God loves it, and God loves keeping them moving. I don't know if you know this about God, but he really does like to keep you moving, and just when you think you got him figured out, he's going to shift over on you, you know, and because he likes to keep you close and to remind you this is a spiritual journey. I know I've said it a lot. I need you to say it out loud one time. Say, this is my spiritual journey. 
And so he walks with them. He gives them all kinds of things to do, the, the anointing of the priest and the, the carrying of the Ark of the Covenant. You guys know all of this and all of the different laws and rules. And Moses goes up to a mountain, comes down with Ten Commandments, and all, all kinds of things is, are, are just going on. This is a spiritual journey. Here's, here's my point. You know, when people are being led by God, if you're not careful, you don't realize that you're on a spiritual journey. And you get so comfortable with it until you're tired of explaining to people that you're on a spiritual journey. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the arrival of Saul is because the people were tired of explaining to other nations and other tribes and other people about their spiritual journey. Yeah. The reason God marks something with time or with calendars, the reason he sets a pattern yeah. is so that when the pattern is broken, you either know it is a deviation from something that's supposed to be done or it's a departure because something new is getting ready to happen. But you don't know which unless you're tracking with the pattern and paying attention. Hmm. So now the people come to God and they're telling God, we want to be like all the other nations. We want to be like everybody else. And we're tired of explaining to people about this cloud. And people say, where are you going? We're following the cloud. Well, what does the cloud do? What, what is this box about? What is this fire about? What is all this about? I say this because this becomes a challenge of the church. That we are not like every other organization. Great organizations, humanitarian organizations, NGOs and nonprofits and community organizations. But we are not them because we are on a spiritual journey. And we can thank God and partner with the United Way. We can thank God and partner with, with uh, numbers of organizations, Red Cross. And we can partner with all kinds of organizations. But the thing that's different about the church is they are not necessarily on a spiritual journey. And so we don't have to try to be them because of our need to explain to people, well, tell me what are y'all getting ready to do? We're following the cloud because we are on a spiritual journey. But the people got tired of explaining it. And they said to God, we want a king. We want to be like everybody else. We want a king. And you can almost hear the emotion, the pathos in God's voice when the scripture says, God said to them, I was your king. And they said, we want a king. We're tired of explaining all of these rituals and things that we have going on. We want a king. So God said, fine, you choose him. And so they chose Saul. Saul, head and shoulders above everybody. To cut to the point, Saul is not a spiritual man. Saul is not chosen by God. Saul is chosen by them. Saul is chosen by them because he looks like a king. He's tall. Be very leery of tall people. <laughs> and <laughs> thank you. He's a, he's a tall guy. Nice looking. Tall, dark, and handsome. And Saul, the Bible says, stands shoulder, head and shoulders above everybody else. And when they saw Saul, when they looked at Saul and seen Saul, see Saul, seen him. When they saw him, Saul, they said, that's our king right there. Now we have a departure, so we have to pay attention. We have a departure because Saul, King Saul, reigns for 42 years. I don't want to complicate it for you, but 42 is the same number of generations until Jesus comes. 42 is the derivative of 6, the number of man times 7, perfection is 42. Saul represents to us the best that man can do. This is the best you can offer. God said, that's the best you can do? Saul, that's who you want. You sure you want him? All right. They chose Saul because that's the best man 
could do. Saul's not a spiritual man. Saul's an image conscious man. Saul always wanted to look good. Saul always wanted everything to work out right. Saul was not on a spiritual journey. Saul intrudes into priestly offices. He lets the people dictate his moves. He's not a spiritual man. The reason I point this out to you is that now something happens in 1 Samuel chapter 16. When God says to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? Fill your horn with oil and get on with it. There's this thing that we have of mourning things that could have been, should have been, wish it was, if I had, if they had, somebody should have, why don't they? Hmm. And if you're not careful, you get into a mourning phase that you don't know how to get out of. I came to tell somebody, are you ready for it? I came to tell somebody your days of mourning are over. It's time for you to stop mourning over what could have been, should have been, what you wanted to do. Fill your horn with oil and get on with it. And so now Samuel gets his horn with oil and he walks to Jesse's house. You have to understand that, that, that Samuel is the man. He's a big deal. I mean, if Samuel is coming to your house, I mean, he is the man. He is the prophet. He is, everybody knows Samuel. If Samuel says something, it's going to happen. His words do not fall to the ground. The Philistines are scared of him. God is with Sam. They know Samuel. So when word gets out, this little Bethlehemite, Jesse, and Samuel announces, I'm coming to your house for a sacrifice. I mean, it becomes a party it becomes a thing like they getting ready for this thing because this is Samuel is coming to our house and they decorate everything they get their best clothes out they clean out the closets comb the hair get it all done up got the best spread out there and here comes Samuel to the house Interestingly enough, they don't invite David. David is out there watching the sheep. And they're so excited. They're so excited because Samuel is here. Samuel is here. They're inside taking selfies. They're posting, rocking it with Samuel. We're tight. Samuel comes into the house and he tells them, I'm here to anoint a king. God didn't tell me his name. He didn't have to. This is a spiritual journey. I'll know him when I see him. So they go back to the pattern. They bring out son number one. And he comes walking out there, Eliab. You got to love Samuel. He looks at him, mm, it's a no. <laughs> they bring out Eliab, son number two. Nah, I'm not feeling that. Eliab, go sit down. Son number three, Shama. They bring him out. Nope. They just keep marching him out there. Eliab, Bindab, Shama, Doodad, Milk Duds. I don't know. All the kids come out, all of them. They just coming in line. And each time he's like, nope, not it, not it, not it, not it. Watch God, watch God. Seven no's. God marked it with a number. Seven no's. And Samuel stands there and says, there must be somebody else because none of these jokers are it. And he said, well, we do have another one. He's out watching the sheep. Come on, get in here with me and realize, here comes David when he's summons, walking into the house, underdressed, smelling like sheep, hair everywhere, stuff stuck up in his hair. Have you ever walked into a room and everybody else knew what was going on and you felt so out of place because nobody even invited you to the party? And when he walks in, Samuel stands up 
and says, that's him right there. And he opened that horn of oil and poured it out on his head in the midst of his mystified brothers, poured that oil on his head. And the Bible declares in 1 Samuel 16 that the Spirit of God came upon David from that day forward. I want to tell you, you got to have the oil. You got to have the oil. The very next thing that happens, this is David being anointed. God prepared a table for him in the presence of his enemies, the ones that overlooked him. Can I tell you that if, if God has your number, it doesn't matter who doesn't invite you to the party. It doesn't matter who doesn't think that you're qualified. It doesn't matter who overlooks you. God has a way of finding you right where you're at. And when that oil gets on you, everything is about to change. One time, put your hands together if you believe what I'm telling you. Everything changes everything changes when our church was in the burn hill plaza we must have been maybe three to five years old we were there for about three three years old to five years old our church was in the burn hill plaza and um i was walking around after service not because anything was wrong because i felt something on the inside of me like we're not we're not we're not hitting it we're not hitting it but i didn't have anything to point to people were good music was good preaching was average but, the, but, but everything, you know, but God was helping us, you know, and there wasn't anything, wasn't anything I could really point at. And so I was just walking around the parking lot, talking to God, asking, what, what is this? What is this? What is this? I'm not, why am I, what, 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 what? You know, how you do when you know something is, but you can't get to it. And I still remember it. I could tell you, I could take you over. I could take you over to the plaza and stand you under the street light where, where it happened. And I stood there and I heard God say to me, my power will always show up where my word is preached. But my presence is reserved for my friends. I remember it was like somebody turned them lights on. Because I was doing what I had known to do. I'm preaching the Bible, trying to organize our church. Not that elders and deacons are wrong, but we were organizing it all like we had seen everybody else do. And we had taken the spirit out of our journey. And that became a time for me where I became very sensitive or tried to be very sensitive to where the oil was flowing, what God was saying. And it started us on a journey of multiplied miracles, multiplied deliverances, salvations, and baptisms, just like we're doing here today. It started because I realized that God is not impressed with the best that we can do. He's looking for someone who is spiritual that he can put the oil on. And there's David. The oil is on him. The very next thing that you see David doing, if you, if you read 1 Samuel 16, you'll track with it. 17 becomes Goliath. But in between that is David. The very first thing that happens is the Spirit of God. This is right after. It goes like this. And the Spirit of God came upon David from that day forward. Next verse. And the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And an evil spirit came to vex him. And the very next thing is they start looking for somebody that can play an instrument, a harp, a lyre, stringed instrument. They start looking for somebody. Can you imagine this? I thought David, watch me now. I thought David was out here by himself all this time watching those sheep, just playing his spiritual songs. He must have been really good because when Saul says, I need somebody to play, Saul's men knew. They said, there's a young guy we've been hearing out here can I tell you that your name is being mentioned in rooms that you don't even know? You think that you're just walking it out with God, but somewhere somebody has taken notice of what God has put on your life, and they may not have said anything yet, but it only takes one moment for somebody to mention your name in the right room, and everything is getting ready to change for you. They call David. David goes in there and plays. And the Bible said that when David played, the spirit that vexed Saul left him. I could go on and track David's life, but you're familiar with it. My point is that David was a spiritual man that valued the power of the oil. 
he knew what it meant for his head to be anointed with oil. And you could track through his life that David would go up against people like Goliath, which was the biggest that man could offer. And through the anointing on his life, he was able to win every battle. And David was undefeatable. Put your hand right there on your head. Come on. Say, I am undefeatable. You don't even know it yet. You're undefeatable. You're undefeatable. And David was undefeatable. You should not mess with David. You should not come against David. I don't care what your army looks like. I don't care how many people you got. You should leave him alone because his head is anointed with oil. And now there is a departure because God is saying, I want to put my people back on a spiritual journey. And David puts them on the spiritual journey. I want to come to the, to the end of this because I want to watch these people be baptized with you. I want to just give you this blessing. And, I, and I, I want to kind of take it this way because you have to understand when you're walking with Jesus that the spiritual journey will demand of you that you put your ego on the altar. Always. Walking with Jesus will bring to the surface all that little stuff in there that makes you bend towards carnality. I don't want you to attach your own definition to it. I'm talking about spiritual versus carnal. To walk with Jesus, you got to, you got to be spiritual. Carnal is when you, I'm not, I'm not just talking about what you might think it is. I'm talking about leaning towards natural things and the way that we can be. And so they're walking with Jesus, and Jesus is like, we're on a spiritual journey. Follow me. Follow me. And by and large, they enjoyed a lot of it. The miracles are great. Loaves and fishes taste good. Lame are walking, blind are seeing, he's walking on water. By and large, most of it's really good. Then there's this, you know, but there's also this other part of it that we're not sure about, you know, this where, you know, you're casting demon out of somebody and jumps into the pigs and the pigs jump in the water. Still trying to figure that one out. Why we end up in storms. Got kicked out of my granddaddy's church because Jesus showed up one day with a whip. Ran up everybody out of the church. He's always, it's, it's this mix that because Jesus is going to bring to the surface that this is a spiritual journey. Got to get on it with him. So I'm, I'm ending it with this kind of, this, this maybe little piece out of like Luke 7 where Jesus does what Jesus normally does. He shows up at somebody's town, shows up at somebody's house and says, I'm going to Simon's house to eat. They're already upset. Simon is a sinner. I said, Simon is a sinner, and he's a Pharisee. And they know how the Pharisees are always messing with Jesus. And Jesus says, let's go to Simon's house. They're already upset. We could be up there talking to Herod. We could be up there talking to big people. We could be, no, we're going to go over here and sit with this sinner Pharisee, Simon. You got to watch tracking with Jesus. Jesus gets into Simon's house, and there they all are. And if you guys remember the customs, remember the customs and the order? It's, all, it's the old boys' network. It's all men in the house. Jesus, Simon, and the 12 apostles in the house because that was their custom. And all of a sudden, here comes this woman with a box of oil. She doesn't even acknowledge anybody else. She wasn't invited. She just walks in. Big old expensive oil. I don't know what kind of perfume ladies wear this expensive, like Chanel? Is that Chanel? Okay. Here comes Sister Chanel. <laughs> Sister Chanel comes in there with a big old box full of oil, expensive oil. In a Gucci case. <laughs> Here comes Sister Chanel with her oil in a Gucci case. And she just walks into the room. Huh. Deviation. Pay attention. Something new is getting ready to happen. And she walks into the room, and you can hear the air go out of the room. I know she ain't here. 
If you read Luke 7, it says everybody knew she was a sinner. That's what, that, don't, don't even give her a name. It says a woman who was a sinner. Uh, did you hear me? A woman who was a sinner comes walking in with her Chanel stuff, walks into the room. She's not supposed to be there, first of all. They think she's not supposed to be there. This is not custom. She just walked in to the old boys network, all sitting around, hanging out. We're not glad because we're here because Simon ain't that cool either. We're at Simon's house, and now here she comes. And she comes in with her big old Gucci, Chanel, whatever. It works for me in my imagination. If it don't work for you, don't mess up my thing because it's working for me. And she comes walking in and walks into a room uninvited, walks into a room where people are rolling their eyes, where people breathing under their breaths, and she has no acknowledgement of their hostility because they are not the reason that she's there. Oh my God, I just said something. You can tell what you're after by what you're able to ignore. When you are after Jesus, I can get past your attitude, your ego. I can step over you rolling your eyes. I can get past what you've been saying because I didn't come here for you. I came here for Jesus. Somebody say, I hear you. She's just stepping over top of people, you know, if you remember them. I, in my mind, I see the whole picture, Middle Eastern now, you know, laying on the ground, all eating food, and that happening. She's just stepping over John and Andrew and Mark and, like, get out of the way. And they're like, ah, ah, ah. but they whisper behind each like, I ain't paying attention to you. And she takes that expensive ointment, hmm, and she anoints it. She pours it on Jesus' head. Yeah. Jesus does not refer to himself as the son of Abraham. He doesn't refer to himself as the son of Noah. He refers to himself as the son of David. And the anointing always has a way to find its way to who should be king. And David is the most perfect picture in the Old Testament of who Jesus is. He's the shepherd who becomes the king. He's anointed in front of his brethren. He came unto his own, and they received him not. But to as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. He is our David who killed our Goliath. He is. He is the most perfect type. He is the king of Judah. He reigns over the tribe of Judah. And Jesus being the son of David, one person had the good sense. A woman who was a sinner brought her expensive ointment and anointed his head. And they started murmuring and complaining. And Jesus got to them because he said the problem is you think you're better than her but I came into your house and you didn't wash my feet I came into your house and you didn't anoint my head but this woman has anointed me for my burial I got to tell you something the Bible will teach us that they went all the way from that time that dinner all the way to the cross smelling like Chanel Every place they went, they walked around and they said, y'all smell good. Y'all smell. There's something about pouring the oil out on Jesus that will fill up a room and cause you to smell like the anointing, cause you to bless people like the anointing is upon your life. I believe that you are coming into a time where you got to get over mourning all of the stuff that's ever happened to you. Get on past it. Fill your horn with oil and get on with it. Everybody stand for just one minute. Everybody stand for just one minute because this is, this is my prayer that I want to pray for you today. I want to pray the blessing from Ecclesiastes that your garments will always be white and that your head will never lack oil because it changes everything. It changes everything. I know you're smart, but you need oil. You may be without friends, but don't be without oil. You may be without a promotion, but don't be without oil. 
You may be without recognition, but don't be without oil. And I want to pray the prayer and the blessing over you today that may your garments always be white. You know what that means, right? Garments are like the garment of praise, the spirit of heaviness, righteousness, peace, joy, all of that. May your garments be white and may your head never be without oil. And I want to tell you that there was a woman in the Old Testament whose husband had passed and the prophet said to her, she said to the prophet, she said, my husband served the Lord and served you and he's gone and now the enemy has come after our sons and make them creditors after the next generation and he says what do you have she said I have a pot of oil in my house can I tell you it's time for you to find your pot of oil it's time for you to fill your horn with oil and go so that you don't forget the God who brought you out the God who made a way for you the God who stepped into your time and space and calendar and all of the things that you do, he stepped in. And our prayer of blessing for you today is going to be that your garment will always be white and that your head will never lack oil. Everybody that will take that say, that's me right there. And I want to say to you today, if you're in this building, watching online under the sound of my voice, and you've never committed your life to Jesus, Salvation is not about you fulfilling all of these things that I talked about earlier, the 613 odd laws, Levitical laws. Those were there to establish God at the center of their lives. But then when Jesus came, he came to put it in you. He came to put it in you. So salvation is not what you do for God. It's what God has already done for you. And he gave Jesus for you. You may not be serving God. Maybe living your own way, doing your own thing. But just before we pray this prayer of blessing, we're going to pray the prayer of salvation. What a beautiful time of the year it is to be saved. To be able to realize that Jesus was the gift that God gave you because you could not do what you needed to do for yourself. You could wear all the right clothes, eat all the right food. Go to all the Christmas and Easter services, observe all the religious activity, burn all the candles, kneel and genuflect and take communion. You could do all of those kind of things and it would still be the best that you could offer. And God says, what I want from you is for you to get what I have to offer so that you can live it from the inside out. And there are people here today that are not here by accident, but God has marked this day for you. And I'm going to pray a prayer, a salvation prayer, which is a simple prayer. It's, a, it's, it's admitting, confessing that you are a sinner, that he is God and you are not, that he came and died for you and rose on the third day to open up heaven for you and to make you a part of his family. And then you get on your spiritual journey and start walking it out. And you say, I'm in this place today and that's the prayer I need to pray today. Today is my day. Just throw your hands straight up in the air. We're gonna pray it all together. God bless you. God bless you. I see you guys back there. Come on, where are you at? Wave at me like you just won something. I see you, dear, over here, wherever you may be. Here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna pray this prayer. I'm gonna pray this prayer and I'm gonna, pr and I'm gonna pray the prayer of blessing upon you that your head will never lack oil. And then Pastors Phil and Meredith, one or both are going to come up here and lead the baptism and tell those of you that raised your hand that we're getting ready to pray for right now what your next steps are, okay? But let's do this. This is a beautiful thing we can do. We all go, let's all pray this prayer together because it won't hurt anybody to pray it. And that way somebody doesn't have to pray it by themselves. Okay, come on. Let's put some strength in the air today and say, Dear God, I come to you knowing I am a sinner I have failed I have sinned but I have faith and I believe Jesus died for me and rose on the third day come into my heart save me forgive me and make me a child of God and I will start my spiritual journey 
from this day forward and my confession is Jesus is the Lord of my life somebody clap your hands and thank God for these right here oh my goodness that's a beautiful thing that's a beautiful, they're not magic words. They're not magic words. If you mean it, it works. If you mean it, it's real. It means something if it means something. All right, here comes the prayer. Pastors, Phil and come on up here because, or whoever's coming, come on. Come on, put your hand right on your head. This is the prayer that your head will never lack oil. May you go through this season. And from now on, may you remember that when you may lack things that other people have that you can say may my head never be without oil may God always be with me may God always lead me may God always guide me may God always put words in my mouth and can I tell you this is the prayer that you should pray over your pastors because the local pastors are the head of the local church Jesus is the head of the church but everything has leadership everything has head some of you are leading families and leading businesses, but guess what? Here comes a promise to you. I think if you'll pray it, I believe that may your head never lack oil. Every time Phil and Meredith get up, these pastors get up and begin to preach to you that you can come to the house of God saying, our pastor's head, they will never lack oil because we speak it over their life in the name of Jesus. Somebody say amen. Come on, come on and clap your hands one big time. God bless you guys. Church, if you appreciated hearing from Bishop Pitts this morning, can you just let him know how that message touched you? Can we thank God for an ever-present word in this house? Amen. As we move into next year, one of the things we're going to do as part of next year is start talking about and reminding us who is it that we are as a church? What are the central things that we focus around? So much of this church, like so much of your life, has changed over the last couple of years, and so many of who we are as we gather together are new. And as we were going through and Phil and I saying, how do we communicate the things that are in here? One of the things that are on the things that we're going to be talking talking about next year is that we have always been and we will always continue to be a spirit-led church that in everything that we do and one of the things we talked about is what Bishop was saying today that we want to be a church that follows the cloud that God whatever you're doing that picture that he gave the the children of Israel as they came out we want to be people who always are are upward in our in our gaze and always saying, God, wherever you are, it makes us, well, I won't, I won't preach the whole thing now. You have to keep coming in 2023 because I'll get lost, but it makes us have to always be ready to move because today we're getting ready to celebrate people's next step of baptism. And we just rejoiced with people who moved out of a life led by themselves and into a life led by Jesus. And it's an incredible thing. I was thinking as Melissa was leading us in our giving earlier, I started thinking about this scripture. There's this scripture in the book of Malachi that says, and bring your full tithe into the storehouse that my house may be full. And it's talking about that, that the resources of the house would be full. And we talk about all the time that we want to be a church that never doesn't reach the vision that God gives us because our supply is too limited. But I started thinking as well that in the New Testament, God says that we are his harvest. And it's this mystical connection that happens that when we bring our tithe and our giving into the storehouse so that the resources are full, God honors that and the people, the harvest is full. Because what happens is to get these people here in this moment right now has been so many moments and so many touch points and so many things that so many people have done all the way. It was them going through growth track and it was calls that they've received so someone can speak to them about what it means to be baptized. And it was someone getting here early to set things up and someone setting up. And all of our giving is so that his house would always be full. And I want you to know that every time that you give and every time that you see someone baptized, I hope that you see that connection. 
because what you are getting ready to do today as you move into your next step of making a public declaration of your faith is something that believers have done for century on century to say, I want to step out of my old life and step into my new life and I want everybody to know about it. And we as a church family are so excited to celebrate this moment with you. We are ready to rejoice with you and to celebrate with you as you make this next step today. And what I want you to know and I want you to think about, I got to share with you earlier that when we participate in baptism, one of the things that I think is cool about it is that we practice a step of our faith that Jesus himself went through, that Jesus himself was baptized. And one of the things I always think about is that when Jesus came out of the water, it says that the heavens opened up and the sound of God's voice was heard saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And when you come out of that water today, maybe the physical heavens won't open and a physical voice won't, but in your spirit, I want you to hear God saying over you, this is my child in whom I am well pleased. I want you to know that he loves you and he is rejoicing over you today. And I believe that all of heaven is standing, peering over saying, look at those people getting baptized today. So if you're part of the church family, we want you to celebrate and rejoice with us in this moment. As these guys come and get themselves set, Phil is getting ready to tell us and read through all of the names of people who are getting ready to get baptized today. If you know that you've taken this step, if you have a friend, a family member, why don't you just shout out and celebrate with us as we celebrate those who are being baptized today, amen? Church, no matter where you are today, whether you're down here on the floor or whether you're in the balcony or whether you're joining online today, this is a significant moment for our entire church family. This is not just a big deal for those people that are wearing blue shirts today. It doesn't matter what color shirt you're wearing. It doesn't matter how tall or how short you are today. This is a significant moment in the life of our church. And so we just, uh, we're so, so ready to celebrate uh, what God has been doing in the lives of these people. And I wanna read their names now so that you know exactly who it is that is getting ready to get baptized. God, we're thankful for the fact that Sarah Parides is getting baptized today. We're thankful that Tara Fisher is getting baptized today, that Frijon Golden is getting baptized today, that Jordan Fell is getting baptized today, that Marissa Williams is getting baptized today, that Zachary Browning is getting baptized today, that his brother Holden Browning is getting baptized today, that Lisa Edwards is getting baptized today, that Tiffany Wood is getting baptized today, and that Mariah Ware is getting baptized today. Come on, we're excited about it. We're celebrating what God has been doing in the lives of everybody that's getting baptized here at Cornerstone Church today. There is a river where goodness flows. There is a fountain that drowns sorrows. There is an ocean deeper than fair. The tide is rising, it's rising. There is a current, it's overflowing. The flood, It's rising, let's see bursting, bursting up from the ground. We sing bursting. We come alive in the river. We come alive. We come alive.
black open prison door Set all the captives free Spring up a well Spring up a well Spring up a well in me Nothing can stop We're dancing in the street Spring up a well that you all stayed to celebrate with those who took the next step. So you are officially dismissed at this moment. But before you go, I just wanted to remind you guys that we have an opportunity for you to hear the songs that we've been singing here on stage on um, our Seastone Sunday morning playlist. If you go to the corner, you can scan the QR code and you can either download Apple Music or Spotify playlist and you can hear all the songs we've been singing up here during worship. Y'all have a beautiful Sunday and go tell somebody about Jesus. Hey, so take me to the river. Take me to the river. Yeah. Take me to the river.
Surrounded by 